So let's go and break down this case study. You're dispatched to a local urgent care for a 28-year-old female with an altered mental status. Dispatch advises you that the patient was found in the bathroom of the facility by the medical staff and appears to be approximately eight to nine months pregnant. She's altered, confused where she is, what's going on, who everybody is around, um, but airways patent. She's breathing normally, skin is warm and dry, and she has been incontinent to urine. And you notice that that urine has a very strong ammonia odor. Her heart rate's 98, a normal sinus rhythm. Her blood pressure is 182 over 102. She's 98% on room air. She's afebrile and slightly hyperglycemic with a finger stick of 146 or 8. She has an ultramental status. Her pupils are perla. And judging by the size of her belly, she's estimated to be in the third trimester. Has no notable contractions, the abdomen is soft, no grimacing or any you know, abnormalities within the belly region. And she does have some slightly pitting pedal edema. Lungs are clear and equal in all fields, and she does have some nausea and vomiting. So the vomiting she's been coming up, mostly clear with some food in it. The medical staff gives you the records from the patient, and she has a history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. They state that she was checked in to be seen for a headache. And the nurse also states that she was fine when she got here. So you're asked, what is your differential diagnosis? What additional assessments would you want to perform? And overall, what is your plan of care? So let's dive into it. So again, we begin with that differential diagnosis of what could be causing this acute altered mental status. Okay, so we start thinking about overdose. Well, she went altered, was kind of confused and staying confused, but the nurse says was fine when she got here. Um, nothing showing her, no respiratory depression, pupils were perla, you know, no pupillary constriction or dilation. Nothing really giving off the vibes of some type of overdose. Okay, so the big things we're seeing out is the altered mental status with the hypertension. Okay, so we start thinking about those big things of what really sticks out to us and that hypertension. Okay, so we don't notice pupillary issues, uh, no crazy dysrhythmias. So we're kind of ruling out an overdose at this time. Then we can go, go with psych. Yeah, but it seems to be acute. The nursing state that she was fine when she got here. So it seems like that she had a perfectly fine mental status. And then something between their contact while she was in the bathroom made her become altered. And so nothing really alluding out into there. And no type of delirium states, just general confusion. So we notice, hey, we got that strong urine smell. Well, that starts throwing flags to UTI. Okay, but again, she was afebrile. We didn't have a fever with that. Uh, she was hypertensive and, you know, no hypoxia, no abdominal issues, no other complaints have really come out other than originally she was there for a headache, found to be altered with hypertension. Okay, so UTI we can maybe still question it, but to cause that acute, sudden altered mental status, not likely. That's gonna be a slower onset. So we'll kind of slightly cross that one out. And we think about stroke, that quick altered mental status, hypertension, we start thinking about you know, major neuro issues. Well, nothing was notable there other than confusion. So nothing was noted in the presentation about any type of facial symmetry, you know, hemoplegia, anything to really think about here other than hypertension and that altered mental status. And I think about TBI, well, maybe she went into the bathroom and slipped and fell and hit her head. Well, if you start asking those type of questions and assuming, well, what if this, what if that? You start asking what ifs 
and putting things into scenarios that aren't supposed to be there, you're diving too deep and you get into what we call a wormhole. You're overanalyzing. Okay, so nothing noted there. There was nothing given in the scenario to dictate some type of trauma, no bleeding. She's just hypertension altered and that nausea vomiting. So we're kind of ruling out trauma. And then we're down here with seizure and eclampsia. Okay, so there's nothing notable to where we could really rule out seizure. She was fine, and at some point in an unwitnessed time, she acutely became altered. And yeah, a person being slightly altered could present that way when they are in a post-dictal state of a seizure. And let me start thinking about, oh, the big red heron. Or is it a red heron that she's pregnant, experiencing these complications? Okay, so hypertension goes into preeclampsia. But now if, you know, she's hypertensive and, you know, preeclampsia goes into that excess protein in the urine as well. So we haven't done the urinalysis, so we can't generally assume that yet. But if we were to suspect a seizure and preeclampsia, well, now we're at the point where it is no longer preeclampsia. It is just simply eclampsia. So that's what we're going with. In the stages of preeclampsia, what is happening is we're starting to notice that, hey, they've gotten some pedal edema here being developed. The heart pressure, it is just maxing out. Okay, so the heart becomes under a strain, fluid can start to develop in those lower extremities. And then we have, you know, breakdown of proteins within the kidneys. A breakdown of protein gets down in the urine and excreting extra protein within the urine. So then it's causing strain on the kidneys. Strain on the kidneys causes issues with blood pressure. So anytime the kidneys can become damaged, damaged, it's hard to regulate blood pressure, hard to regulate blood pressure, and kidneys being not able to filter out as well, double fold and developing that pedal edema. But then when it goes into eclampsia, that's when it starts to involve the brain. Okay, so the pressure has gotten too high and all the vessels on the brain are becoming squeezed. So inevitably some increased ICP causing issues and strain on the brain, which is going to result in causing those seizures. Okay, so we start thinking about what's too high. So how much is too much of a hypertension? So blood pressure too high. How high is that going to be? Well, we start thinking about most general guidelines is over 160 millimeters of mercury is considered like a hypertensive crisis anytime in pregnancy. Because if we also think about from a physiological standpoint, once you start hitting 180-ish by most research, that's susceptible for an aneurysm. Okay, so we definitely don't want them to get up to this point. And, you know, in a scenario, systolic pressure of 180. Okay, so over 160, very likely to develop into full eclampsia. Predisposing factors that are um, going to make it even more of a high risk for that is already having a history of hypertension, a history of kidney disease, and, you know, diabetes kind of play an effect into both of those. So this patient unfortunately had pretty much all those, had a history of hypertension and a history of diabetes, which goes in to start causing some acute kidney disease by both processes, okay? So diabetes, hypertension, works damages on the kidneys. So putting those two together is gonna to result in kidney disease. So symptoms you'll see is they can have difficulty in breathing because they can start having just fluid being built up maybe around the sides or ascites into the abdominal cavities make it a little bit harder for the diaphragm to move especially the fetus in there the hypertension pedal edema developing neurological issues um, such as you know vision complications headache and then ultimately seizure okay so when it's a seizure that's full eclampsia and then the other one proteinuria Okay, so this is something that, you know, we're not going to necessarily be able to see, 
but knowing that there is protein buildup in their urine, um, in this scenario, they were incontinent, so they can have overall bladder issues. Sometimes they have difficulty urinating, and sometimes they can just quickly become incontinent. So what we're gonna do for them is, if necessary, is managing that seizure. Okay, so again, this is, we gotta keep mom alive to keep the baby alive. So if it is status epilepticus and they're to the point where the mom's gonna possibly cause you know, anoxic injuries to the fetus, trying to keep mom stable to keep baby alive, we have to stop the seizure with some anti-convulsant. Begin only if necessary, trying to be precautious in this. Okay, so hopefully we're getting them and we're trying to prevent the seizure. So hopefully we can encounter these patients in a preeclamptic phase before we experience them in the eclamptic phase. So again, if they are seizing, we still treat them as a standardized seizure patient. And then the ultimate goal is trying to control this. Again, like I said, hopefully we're trying to prevent them from going into the eclamptic phase. So we want to be focusing on lowering that blood pressure approximately 20%. We don't want to cause a crash or a sudden plummet in it to return it to normal. We just want to get them out of that hypertensive crisis phase. Okay. So ideally trying to bring that down, you know, 20% or so maybe per hour, but ideally trying to get them under 160. Two main staples in doing so, depending on what your protocols are, of nitroglycerin or labetalol. Both of these have been shown to be safe uh, for the fetus because that's our large concern if the patient is pregnant of what's going to cross that placental barrier and possibly be given to the baby. Again, that's why anticonvulsants are the precaution because those have been shown to cross into the placenta barrier to get into the baby. But again, not shown that it's causing huge known that if you give them an anticonvulsant that it's going to cause a birth defect. They're not that direct correlation, but it does get into fetal circulation. But these have been shown to be effective and safe on the fetus for controlling that hypertensive crisis. And then we have the magnificent magic mag sulfate. So mag sulfate has such a, a wide purpose throughout medicine. And in the um, instances of preeclampsia and eclampsia, where it comes into play is if we are fearful of that patient developing eclampsia, that they are known preeclamptic, that they're in a hypertensive crisis, that we're fearful that seizures could develop and are in full eclampsia. Mag sulfate has been shown to be safe for prevention of eclamptic phases. Now, the difficult part in pre-hospital medicine is a concept that we can't measure how much magnesium is already in their blood to make sure that we're not gonna cause hypermagnesia in these patients. And we know that too much magnesium can cause basically uh, muscles to not work, including your diaphragm. So it can cause respiratory depression, and we definitely don't want that. Uh, in the stages of eclampsia, it, it works by multiple ways. So it's kind of those things that they study and are still not a thousand percent sure how everything goes into play, but it's been shown that it helps prevent um, further seizures by, it kind of slows down neural conduction. Okay, so with that seizure, uh, possible more seizure activity, given mag sulfate if they already have seized, has been shown to be safe to prevent additional seizures from occurring. Okay, so we've already had the point where they broke their seizure. We don't want them to seize again. Give them mag sulfate in that to prevent um, neural protection, basically. If they are hypertensive, it's a smooth muscle relaxant, and it's actually shown to relax the arteries some and then cause you know, less strain on the heart and then inevitably lowering, assisting in lowering the blood pressure and overall strain on the vascular system. So it works in multiple ways to assist in those patients who are in the preeclamptic phase or are already eclamptic. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Hopefully you're able to get some things out of this. So remember preeclampsia is excessive protein within the urine, hypertension, possible some neurocomplications, vision issues, pedo edema development, 
and then when it develops into full eclampsia that is that there is an overload on the central nervous system causing seizures again we're trying to prevent that hypertensive crisis and if they are found significantly hypertensive over 160 we need to begin treatment for those patients so thanks for tuning in catch you all the next time